gentlemen, welcome back to the T. Shanley starting a business, building a brand blog. This one, big number, 256. So I gotta go over the church. Um, I know that last time I did a video like this, I'm like, this is last time until I'm gonna do the reveal. Well, here's the deal. I gotta go there to meet my designer, talk about a few things. I figure I'll show you one last time before I actually reveal what it is. But I do wanna talk about something uh, when I come back, actually, which is my fitness center. Fitness center? What, what, fitness center? Do I, am I open? Is that what that? <laughs> so here's the deal. Got a question on the last vlog about Yo Alpha. After all your experience now, right? T. Shanley, Pete and Pedro, all the businesses that you've done. Do you think now, looking back, you could make a fitness center successful with the experience that you have and learning the lessons? And so I want to talk about it. But first, let's go to the church. So I cannot tell you how excited I am that this whole renovation project thing is almost over. Um, we plan on opening now in about a month and so uh, everything's like starting to come together now and so it's actually starting to look good. Um, nothing's been like delivered or anything like that but uh, you'll see um, the floors actually are being put in and they look amazing uh, some of the tile in the bathrooms amazing amazingly expensive but the problem is that I've got really expensive taste and um, and you know it, it's one of those things where okay so so I say that I've got expensive taste which I do but I just want it to look great and I wanted to I just want it to be right you know and so um, <laughs> I've got expensive taste. One of the reasons why the budget is over is because of the selections that I picked, right? When I was getting quotes for this whole thing uh, from my general contractor, he quoted everything, but he didn't know that I was going to pick like the nice tile or, you know, the higher end, you know, flooring. And so, you know, a lot of the reasons why we've gone over budget is my fault. The fixtures, I hired a designer, things of that nature. But, you know, I, I'm a firm believer in do it right and do it once as opposed to do it half ass and have to do it again. So we're about a month away from actually opening the facility and um, it's getting exciting. Things are really starting to come together now. Some of the finishes are going in. I believe the designer today is dropping off like all the light fixtures. We got one light fixture like done that looks amazing that I'm gonna show you. Um, but yeah, it's coming together. It's starting to look really beautiful and I can't wait to tell you what it is. I also can't wait to invite you to actually come and check it out if you are in the Marietta, Georgia area or are going to be. But seriously, doesn't it look sexy, right? Those doors, those windows. That big chandelier, look at that thing. That thing is so sexy, it's ridiculous. We also started hanging some of these other um, LED strips to add some more lighting. Uh, let me take in the back and show you the bathroom. Carrera marble on the walls, little accent piece. The floors also Carrera marble. This one is actually gonna be the black marble bathroom. That is going to be the trim or the accent strip going across like that. All right, uh, give me an idea. So we had to decide on um, paint colors for this wall here. Also, um, the hallways going back. All right, which, which, which black do you like best? Uh, we ended up going with this. The color is iron ore. Let me actually take you upstairs and show you what's going on there. But what do you think? It's looking pretty sick, right? All right, so they just put down the skim coat. They're getting ready to put the flooring down up here. It's starting to come together a little bit and look really good. Um, there are all of like the lights and, and you know, bars for like handicapped bathrooms and things of that nature. Um, but yeah, it's, it's looking awesome. I'm getting excited, but uh, there's still a lot to do. Anyway, let's go back to the office because I want to talk a little bit about if I open a fitness center again. And we're back and I spilled coffee on my shirt and so I changed into the most amazing t-shirt in the history of t-shirts. So here's the deal. The question I want to dive into is actually from last vlog. If you guys have a business question, all right, this is a business vlog. The reason why I do this, the reason why we do this, and the reason why it has been 256 consecutive weeks of videos and vlog is because it's supposed to help you um, or at least give you some insight and, and help you on your entrepreneurial journey. Um, I sure wish I had this vlog when I was, uh, when I was starting my entrepreneur. Blah 
entrepreneurial journey, which is what I want to talk about next because my fitness center was kind of the start of my entrepreneurial journey. Um, he says, hey, Aaron, do you think the business, with the business knowledge that you have earned over the years from T. Shanley, Pete and Bejo, Enemy and Influential Media, would, uh, would have helped you, would have helped save your fitness center back in the day? In other words, do you think if 45-year-old Alpha opens a fitness center, would it be successful? So I'm only 44, let's get that straight. With all of my business knowledge now, my experience through things that have worked, things that haven't, could I make that fitness center successful? And I don't think I could have, honestly. And, and, and there are a few reasons for that. Reason number one is, and I, and I hate saying this out loud, <laughs> actually. Um, my business partner that I trusted, okay, so when, we, when I started that fitness center, I was relying very heavily, because I was young, I was like, I think I was, how old was I then? Uh, 98, I was young. Anyway, I was relying super heavily on her to basically do and put everything together. And I was like her partner, but she was the person that was really driving the ship. She was the one who funded it or financed it. She was the one who basically structured everything and signed the lease. And actually, I co-signed the lease, which is why um, I had to file bankruptcy because the lease and, and, and the bank loans and everything, like I was part of that. But she had a business before um, where she was like partners in like a technical writing business. And so she did have some business acumen. But she didn't honestly, like I don't think that her skill set and her temperament was not necessarily now looking back, and this is really uncomfortable for me to talk about, is um, I, don't, I don't think she was really good at, at, um, at a lot of the decisions she made were bad. Let's just put it that way. And be, me being naive and me being sort of, this was kind of like my first rodeo, I allowed her to dictate a lot of things. I also was reliant upon her because she was a lot of times funding it out of her own her own pocket. And so until we bought, built up like our client base big enough that you know we were taking salaries, and my salary back then for the time that I had that fitness center was twenty four thousand dollars a year. That was it. Uh, Two thousand dollars a month is what I um, what I was paying myself or what we were paying me. And so when I look back at all of the sort of the way that that all unfolded, and the other part of this is that when I did that fitness center, the first part was like a personal training studio. Do I think now I could do a personal training studio that was successful? Probably, but things have changed so much in the fitness industry. You know, back then, there weren't many personal training studios. There were only like big gyms. Well, since then, this was back in 2000 and like. Uh, 2001, I think. Um, I can't remember. 2001, I think. Um, there weren't like these 24-hour places. You weren't going to gyms. Like LA Fitnesses weren't even around at that point where I lived. And this was back in the day when you could actually charge 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 dollars an hour for a personal training service or, or, or session. Now, you know, personal training, it's, it's like, it's, it's almost like a dying profession. And, and honestly, it, it is a dying profession. And, um, and it's very hard to make a living as a personal trainer. It's very difficult now to make a living as a personal trainer. Um, a lot of these places like the LA Fitnesses, you're going in for a 30 minute session. The trainer makes like eight bucks or something like crazy. Back when I started personal training and, and when I got a job at Crunch prior to opening the, the uh, personal training studio, you know, we were, I was charging like 80 bucks an hour, 90 bucks an hour. When we opened the gym, I think I was doing like, I think it was close to like 80 or 90 bucks a session. And so that's, you know, that's great money, 80 or 90 bucks an hour. Now it's very challenging to make any real money being a personal trainer because they sell like half hour sessions, the packages are small and really they, they try to just get, you know, it, it's a volume thing. And so in order to make like a living, you need a ton of sessions packed together but the truth is, you know, 30 minute sessions, can you get something done? I, I personally believe in our sessions. So the personal training industry has changed drastically. I don't know how, you know, people make it. I think that the niche now is online coaching, online training, you know, developing a, a personality or a brand or a following online and then selling coaching, selling meal plans. And that's a way to kind of do it in today's world. In terms of in-person, I think it's hard. I do have somebody that I know that has a personal training studio. They do more like group fitness now. 
But, you know, with this whole COVID thing, that took a whack at their business, right? They couldn't do anything in person, and so everything was outside. I just feel like that is a very, very hard business to get into. The whole CrossFit thing, that is also a decent business, I think, from what I understand. But you need, once again, you need a lot of people to go to your gym in order to make money. There's a CrossFit place uh, near me that, like, I drive by, and there are, like, three cars in the parking lot. I know that he's not making any money. Now, the upside to, you know, places like CrossFit is that the overhead is super low, right? You need a warehouse. Typically, you just need, like, some barbells and, and racks and balls and ropes and, and rings and stuff like that. You don't necessarily need all of the fancy equipment like you do in a fitness center. You know, my treadmills back then, I think each treadmill was like eight to $10,000. I mean, commercial grade fitness equipment is super expensive. Like one leg extension machine, six grand, seven grand. And so it really adds up. And so to go in and open a fitness center today, you literally would need, you know, half a million bucks. Combine that with the fact that there are gyms all over the place. A lot of gyms are actually shutting down now because with COVID, a lot of these small, like, boutique places, they just didn't make it. And the rent is still due. You know, if they lease the equipment, that's still due. And so I've, I know personally, um, the little 24-hour place that I go to, she had, I think, three locations. She's down to one now. And so the upside, if you are somebody that wants to start a fitness center, you can get some really great deals on used fitness equipment. Um, but it's a, it's a really challenging business. But the one thing that we have now that we didn't have back then is the internet. Or actually, I, we had the internet, it just wasn't what it is now. And so advertising now for a physical brick and mortar store is a little bit easier, or a fitness center would be a little bit easier in that regard, but it still takes money. There's still a lot of noise out there though because of the amount of competition. So to answer your question, do I think I could have been or made that business successful if I had the skills I had now. Yes, I think it could have been more successful. Do I think ultimately it would have worked? I don't know. To do it now, I would never, ever open a fitness center now. Spoiler alert, that is not gonna be a fitness center. I would not be putting Carrera marble <laughs> on the walls of my bathroom if it was a fitness center. Anyway, the next business question I want to get to is from a friend of mine, actually, somebody that I've met multiple times at the Men Influential Conference. His name, name is Sid, and Sid makes boots, which are pretty cool boots. I've, I've tried the boots on. They're, they're really nice boots. Um, Sid says, business question, hey, Aaron, I own a boot brand called YRX Boots, and um, I know that, but now you guys know it's yrxboots.com. You may remember me from the Shark Tank-esque pitch from the Men Influential 2020. Here is my question. So the way that it, we, we did something kind of cool at the last conference, um, because there are a lot of entrepreneurs there, we basically had audition, not audition, but we sent an email, said, hey, if you've got a business or you've got a product, you want to pitch the Sharks, it was me, it was Kelly, um, I believe it was Eric from Beard Brand. There were some of us um, entrepreneurs that were up on stage, and so some, some people, I think it was three or four people, got up and sort of pitched their business and got feedback from us. And it was uncomfortable for some of these people. And Sid was somebody who it was uncomfortable for. I can't remember exactly why, but anyway. Sid, you were doing like a ton of different styles, a ton of different like options and trying to give people too much. And we said, no, like back down, which is another incredible point. Anyway, he says, his question, sorry, <laughs> I'm just remembering back. He said, and, and Sid has the best eyebrows I've ever seen in my life. They're just like perfect and amazing. That's one thing that I remember about Sid. Um, he says, with this, <laughs> what's up, Sid? <laughs> so is this crazy? Okay, I gotta calm down. I'm excited about this question. Here's my question. With this global pandemic, our sales have not been great as people don't wanna pay $199 for fashion boots as much uh, with people staying at home. Furthermore, the influencers we used to use during the summer are now booked up for fall and winter already with our bigger boot footwear, with bigger boot footwear brands. As you know, we still have to keep paying our warehouse shipping fees every month, regardless if the inventory is moving or not. Um, what are some other creative ways we can market ourselves during this time so that we can continue to compete in the marketplace with awesome boots? The apparel industry has definitely been hit hard during this pandemic. Um, I know that for a fact that grooming industry, personal care is actually boosted up a little bit, but apparel, clothing, definitely down. And Sid, your business is, is, is one of those, you know, not casualties, but you have definitely felt the effects. You know, people are sitting at home, like I don't remember 
the last time I've gone online and bought like a piece of clothing where prior I was always like thinking about, you know, style and getting dressed and, and going shopping. I love the process and, and I love shopping, but I haven't because I'm like, where am I going to wear it? I can't even foresee, you know, when things are going to start to get normal again. And so that being said, what I would recommend is the money, if there is money to, that you are going to be spending on some of these influencers, I would start, you know, basically trying to figure out the, the paid advertising on Facebook and Instagram game. I would also utilize very heavily your, your email list that you have or that you've, you've built over the years. I would also possibly try to run some really cool like giveaways, you know, to get email addresses. Say, hey, we're giving away X, we're doing this, you know, getting people excited. And then when people get excited, then you offer them like some type of deal, like buy one, get one 50% off, or, you know, buy one, get one free. Or like, like I think there are probably some promotions that you could run that are like, they kind of have to be like, not like too good to pass up. But if the, the idea is that you just need to start recouping or regenerate or generating some revenue so that you can pay, you know, your warehouse. So I am on your website, yrxboots.com. This is a very creative way to sell boots, <laughs> guys. If you want to go hook sit up or help sit out, uh, go check out his boots. Um, let's see. I'm looking at your website and I'm down at the bottom. I'm trying to go to your social and... There's really no way to, that I can see to get to any social anything. Um, that's a problem. I think you need to spend possibly a little bit of time and energy just tweaking the website a little bit. Maybe, uh, maybe, maybe have some like boot giveaway or something like that where sign up, you know, we're giving away, we give away one pair of boots a week. Sign up to be entered. Um, right now, the only email caps you have is, you know, free shipping and free returns. We want you to love your boots. If for any reason you don't, uh, enjoy a full re refund shipping on us. Why would anybody give you an email address for that? They wouldn't like that. I wouldn't. Um, there's nothing. You're not giving them any value. Maybe you create some type of e-product to give them where, hey, give us your email address and we're going to give you, you know, you know, five super bad ass outfits to wear this fall. They happen to include your boots, right? And so when they get them, when, when they download it, say, hey, since you're looking at this, also here's a coupon. Um, and you can very easily track that. And so for me, I would really double down on your website and figuring out a better way to sort of capture people and then leverage that and, and start using social media a little bit better. You're like, I'm going to actually, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to go on, I'm going to look on. On Instagram, you got 10,800 followers. I mean, you have a lot of followers. Um, you get really bad engagement, so I don't know if you have bought followers. I don't know, uh, but the deal is, I would leverage that. If you really do have 10,800, you know, people that follow you on Instagram, use the shit out of that and start, you know, running contests, giveaways, get people excited, talking about the brands or talking about the brand. And I mean, if you're like, yo, I don't want to, I don't want to give people discounts. I get that, right? But you probably have inventory that you are you know, that you're never going to buy again. And so if there are like some weird sizes or something like that, you could use those or your less popular items and, and use those as promotional tools. Uh, but I think, honestly, I think that was a really good idea that I gave you in terms of an email capture, a lookbook, and, um, and, and use your boots for the lookbook outfits and, and talk about that on social. Be like, yo, we just put together a really super badass, you know, five outfit lookbook on our website. Go sign up. It's a free download. Um, super easy. It's totally free for you. It's free for the customer and you get to pimp and promote your boots. So that's what I would do. Back on your website, your blog doesn't have it. Your last post from your blog was August. 2019. It's been a year, dude. Uh, you haven't been, uh, you haven't been, oh, but now there, there are the links to your, your, let me go to your Facebook. See, this is fun. You've got 3,711 people who have liked your page on Facebook. Bro, you just need, let me go to your photos. Uh, you, you just, you're not, you're not really working this very hard. You're not, you're, are you, do you really want this? You haven't posted on your Instagram since August 17th. And I don't know if that's August 17th this year or last year. Um, does it say if it's uh, years ago? Have you done anything in the past year? Sid, seriously. Dude, I'm not feeling it. I'm not feeling like you're into this. And I'm not feeling like you're, 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 I think I feel like 
you have gotten the wind knocked out of your sail and you're not sure where to go and you were expecting it maybe to be a little bit easier, develop and design super sick boots, offer them at a good price, that's great. That's a starting point. But the hardest part of any business is the marketing. That's it. It is not coming up with a great product. The world is full of amazing products that nobody has heard of because they didn't figure out the marketing. And the marketing is the hardest part. And money doesn't equal a good marketing strategy. Needing money to have a marketing strategy and to actually get sales, you know, you could be emailing and calling your friends. You could literally, you know, put something on your personal page. Hey guys, you know, like there are things that you could do to move the needle and make sales. And if you were desperate enough, I feel like you'd either figure it out or you wouldn't. But, um, but, but Sid, you got to get the work, man, because honestly, this business is, is, is doomed unless you figure out and, and get serious about you know, leveraging what, you've ar what you already have and, and moving it forward. Because right now it is stale, it is stagnant. I think emotionally you're probably drained, but you need help. And, um, and I think the first place you need to, to look for help is in the mirror. When I think about Thursday Boots, who everybody out there has heard of them, has, has possibly even owned a pair, you know, what they really did incredibly well was build up this like, this like ravenous cult-like following, right? They did these drops. It was only available on Thursdays. They had something really cool and really different. Before they ever spent any money on like marketing or advertising, they did all of the, the grunt work basically and, um, and, and made the boots, made the sexy boots, a few, a few options, not a ton of options. And, and, and they developed, you know, their, their cult-like following through, you know, guerrilla marketing and, and, and just telling and talking and, and social word of mouth. And so, you know, it's possible. She tells me it's possible. Thursday Boots absolutely crushes it in terms of sales. They created an incredible product, you know, a great price, and, and they, they just, they did it right. But they are on social media, they are reaching out, they are sending emails, and their business has changed. And that's the cool thing, it has evolved over the years and so it's possible if you want it but you've got to want it and you've got to be able to actually figure it out and do it and if you realize that okay i've done this for three years and i'm really not seeing traffic i'm not getting traction you need to really take a hard look are you going to continue to throw good money after bad and i'm not saying that you are i'm just saying that it's something you need to be honest and and real with yourself and if the passion is gone and if you're like, yo, I'm just not into this, I'm not feeling it, I don't wanna do it anymore, that's another answer that you need to be honest with yourself. But the good news is that you've learned a lot from this process and this company. I'm not saying to give up, I'm just saying if it comes to a point where you've gotta basically, you can't pay your bills, things aren't working, you're not willing to do what you need to do in order to sell boots, you know, organically, you know, Writing's on the wall, my friend, but you're a super great guy and you're smart. You just gotta make sure that this is the right business. You gotta make sure that you're willing to do the work because it's nobody else, it's nobody else. An influencer, two influencers, 10 influencers is not going to be able to grow and sustain your business, period. It's you, it's the strategy, it's the willingness to get up every day and figure shit out. Gentlemen, that's where I'm gonna wrap things up. If you have a business question, down below, start it with business question and ask it. Next week, we'll get to some. Next week also is our quarterly meeting at TJ Anley. I'm gonna be sitting here in Atlanta doing it virtually. The guys, the team, the gals at TJ Anley are going to be having an in-person meeting for most people. And um, I'm really excited. It's gonna be great to connect with people. It's been too long. And we've got some really important and big things coming up. We like big things. We've also got potentially some celebrity endorsements I'll tell you about a little bit later and, um, and some other exciting, exciting things at TJ Hanley. Gentlemen, we love you more than our double monk strap shoes. If you are an entrepreneur, I need you to hear me when I say this. It is not easy. It is hard. It is going to be scary. It is going to be painful. But if you want it bad enough, you can do it.